Dear Dr. George Abraham, the chief guest of the day, the office bearers of head of a mission, fellow parishioners, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so happy to welcome you all to the 15th Alexander Martha Memorial Lecture. Every year, we conduct this lecture in order to cherish the great memories of our late Metropolitan. As you all know, Dr. Alexander Marthoma Metropolitan became the 19th Marthoma of the Marthoma Church on October 23rd, 1976. And he continued in that office till his retirement in 1999. He has taken to eternal rest on January 11, 2000. As Kunyangal remembered the great contributions that he had, he had rendered as a metropolitan to our church, he was a missionary bishop. He was known as a missionary bishop while he was uh, doing the Episcopal ministry to the church. He still continued that vigor and vision when he became the Metropolitan of the Matoma Church. He was very keen to spread the gospel to all over India. With that vision, he encouraged our church to spread the gospel to mission fields of that spread in various villages of India. And during his time, the church was fortunate to begin many Christian mission fields in Southern India, as well as Northern India. Second, he was very keen in the development of Dalit Marthoma Christians. In 1980, all the Dalit Marthoma parishes in our church have elevated to the status of the full status of a Marthoma Syrian church. He was also a champion of ecumenism. He maintained good relationship with other churches, sister churches, as well as with various religious faith. His prophetic messages, both to the church as well as in the political sphere, challenged many people during that period. He was very simple in his lifestyle and kept his ardent faith in Jesus Christ and encouraged the people to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let me introduce dear Georgie into our midst. Dr. Georgie was known to most of you. He is our son-in-law, that means he is the son-in-law of our parish. Georgi now serves as the chief in the Department of Medicine at St. Vincent Hospital, Massachusetts. His wife, VG, as you all know, belongs to this parish. She's the daughter of Joni, Angel, and uh, Pinyamalandi. And while she was in, uh, in, this, in Singapore, she was very active in the church choir as well as all the activities of the parish. We are fortunate to experience and witness their ministry, both Georgie's and uh, Viji's ministry while we served the Boston Carmel Marthoma Church along with my studies in Boston. They are very active, still very active in the church, both are members of the Carmel Mathoma Church Square and uh, Georgie and Viji uh, lead, uh, still the leaders of the choir there. And I am, uh, now I remember how Georgie encouraged me and supported me while we uh, build a new church, build the, the, ch the big church building for the Carmel Mathoma Church. It was instrumental with uh, many other members of that parish to see that 
the church was built in, in the uh, proposed time. So I remember with thanks all the support that he rendered to me as I was serving the Boston Carmel Mahatma Church. Georgie, as a doctor, I, I would say he's a missionary doctor. Missionary in the sense, he was always and has been a channel of grace to the patients at his care. When Malcolm Church, the Diocese of North America started Mexican mission, Jordi was a pioneer in that Mexican mission. Very loyal to Martoma Church, as I said, an active member of the Boston Carmel Martoma Church, and also son of dear Dr. Emmy Abrahamachan. We convey our gratitudes to George and Vidhi, especially children Dia and Shreya. We are so fortunate to have Georgie in our midst to ponder upon the proposed the topic for uh, this evening. On behalf of the Edo Mission Committee and on, on behalf of all of us, I welcome Dr. George Abraham to deliver the 15th Alexander Martoma Memorial Lecture. Also, I welcome you all for attending this lecture through this online platform. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex Achin, for this very, very kind introduction. <clears throat> Good evening to every one of you. I'm very grateful to Alex Achin and Sally Kochima, who remain very dear to us for the invaluable time that we spent together in Boston, as Achin alluded to, and for having invited me again to join this discussion. I'm also thrilled to be back again with the Singapore Church, with whom we have deep ties, not only through Viji, but also all the wonderful fond memories and the lovely music that just rekindled many nostalgic memories of uh, our times uh, when we've been there in Singapore. The late Alexander Mathoma was related to my mother and so was fairly close to our family. When my father was serving as parish priest in Delhi, 1969 to 71, Pirmeni, as Achin alluded to, was the missionary bishop. And so we have pictures of them both going to the Tibetan border to establish a mission station there. I'm not a theologian, nor will I pretend to be one when we have scholars like Achin here. And I hope that our collective time that we spend in contemplation will be mutually rewarding to all of us. It seems but a very short time when we were fortunate to have been there in person in December last year. And I'm particularly happy that Achin is well at this time, unlike the last time. To frame our conversation, I would like to turn your attention to the second part of the gospel according to St. John chapter 13, verse 30. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 30, the verse reads, and it was night. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we pray for your love and compassion to abound as we walk through this challenging season. We ask for wisdom for those who bear the load of making decisions with widespread consequences. We pray for those who are suffering with sickness and all who are caring for them. We ask for protection for the elderly and vulnerable to not succumb to the risks of the virus. We pray for misinformation to be curbed that fear may take no hold in hearts and minds. As we exercise the good sense that you in your mercy provide, may we also approach each day in faith and peace, trusting in the truth of your goodness towards us. Amen. John chapter 13, verse 30. 
and it was night malayalam tarjumayil appol ratri aayirunnu the context is the last supper in the upper room jesus had just finished the blessing the bread and the wine and the whole verse refers to judas iscariot when it says as soon as judas had taken the bread he went out and it was night the last year has been unusual like none other that we have ever experienced in our lifetime and probably will never experience in our lifetime we often say pandemics come about once in a hundred years and this was probably the pandemic in the hundred years recall the last pandemic was the spanish flu of 1918 the coronavirus family is really one that is familiar to us the common cold that is that we all experience every year seasonally is a coronavirus and while there are multiple Uh, subsequent viruses in that family a mutation of that of the beta coronavirus is what we now have as the 2019 coronavirus or sars cov2 those of you in singapore may recall the sars cov1 which was uh, in 2003 and 4 and then we had the middle eastern respiratory virus about a few years later the mers as we call it what's clearly evident is that as man and animals come closer and closer together there has been this mutation and the jump of a virus which traditionally infects only animals into human beings and subsequently multiplying in human beings itself this is from this morning this is the johns hopkins center for system science and engineering which maintains the repository of all coronavirus cases in every country in the world and so we are at 42000 plus cases globally with over a million deaths the us continues to lead with the largest number of cases worldwide and it's not for lack of resources but probably a lack of common sense in our country here followed by india which has now overtaken brazil by just sheer numbers but it just shows you the magnitude of the problem as we see it and continues to exist early on in the pandemic after our experience with sars we learned quickly and the whole virus genome was sequenced so we clearly understand what proteins drive the infection so the protein of most interest is what's called the spike protein the term coronavirus comes because it's got this crown of little spikes which are present all around so it's called looks like a crown hence the term corona the spike is what is really needed for the virus to attach to human cells and so all the vaccine development is developing antibodies to the spike to prevent this attachment and lead to infection so that's the area of interest in the whole viral genome we do understand that even though it's a virus in the common cold family it is far deadlier than the common cold and definitely far deadlier even than the flu and so it is fairly significant in terms of the illness the average rate of multiplication is about 3 people infected from a single person 2.7 to be exact what's most concerning is the mode of infection is a spread via airborne particles both droplets as well as an aerosol or a mist which is not visible to the human eye as a result there is this cloud which continues to get delivered from a person who is infectious which goes on spreading and can spread and form a fairly high concentration and the person breathing that in acquires infection early on in previous aerosol based infections uh, the general feeling was about 6 feet distance is considered a safe distance for not acquiring new infection because the aerosol dissipates in the air however in more recent studies done at the mit and other places this concept of the 6 feet distance has been challenged 
It is particularly challenged in terms of a room or a closed setting. It is also challenged when there is more forceful expiration as occurs when we are coughing, when we are singing, when we are shouting, or when we are talking loudly where that distance may go much longer and may go as much as up to 10 feet or more. In dry air, this moves faster and so travels much longer distances. Humidity tends to make the particles heavier and so it drops to the ground. So clearly that has some implications for us, especially when we look at it from a church standpoint to say, if we are all in a closed room and we are not distanced enough, that aerosol can travel a farther distance than it does with normal conversation because of the forceful expiration that occurs when we are singing or when we are talking or chanting loudly, et cetera. And so we always say we avoid closed spaces. Open air is much better because the virus dissipates in the air and the concentration of virus proportionally goes down. Crowded places, close contact settings are all a no-no. And in a church setting, a few other things we always say is to open all the windows so that there is cross ventilation. As long as there is movement of air, that the viral cloud, if one were to be infected, would dissipate out of the air. Here in the US, we are getting into a colder season where it is difficult to leave windows open. And so we've gotten these HEPA filters or portable air cleaners, which sort of seem to clean the air. And so preventing recirculation of that air as well as cleaning the air makes a difference in terms of trying to minimize the amount of cloud burden. But in Singapore, where the weather is more temperate and where you have that luxury maybe of opening windows and doors, that may be a much more efficient option for you in terms of decreasing the concentration of potential virus. The danger of this virus is that about 20 to 30% of people may have asymptomatic carriage, which means they have no symptoms, but do have virus in their nose and mouth and throat. And they are sometimes very efficient at spreading that virus unknowingly. And so we would not know who is infected and who is not unless we were testing every day. We also understand that the virus is about a two week course of illness if predictably no complications occur. The first week is what we call the viral phase where virus multiplies, sorry. And the next phase is the body's response to the virus, an inflammatory response to the later part of the illness, which sometimes in many people can be unchecked. And so it goes into this huge phase of uncontrolled inflammation, otherwise called the cytokine storm. And the complications that we see in terms of the respiratory damage as well as organ damage all occur because of the inflammatory phase of the illness that we know. So this is the huge cytokine storm. It's the unchecked uh, immune response to trying to control the virus that leads to the complications and often to death. There's no part of the body that's spared. There are some areas which are much more involved, the lungs being notoriously the worst. These are just cross-sectional images from a CAT scan to show you that uh, the lungs develop a major pneumonia uh, which can be life-threatening because you need clear lung to exchange air. And so the absence of that leads to this drowning pneumonia with fluid and fluid overload. It is impressive to see that COVID-19 has taken over as the number one public health burden in the world today. It has overtaken all the other diseases, including tuberculosis, hepatitis B, HIV, et cetera. Just putting into perspective, how dramatically this disease has consumed public health resources and challenged the healthcare community around the world. In the US, we've had a challenge with science, with people decrying the science around the whole virus and its spread and people saying that this is all a hoax and that this is not true. And so that's been an additional challenge with why we have such high rates of illness in the United States. We also have socioeconomic challenges, uh, much as like many other countries in the world, 
uh, disproportionately the African or African-American communities are affected because of not only poverty, uh, but also poor health in general because of that poverty, crowding because they cannot uh, live uh, distanced from each other. There are large families living close together. And so it's disproportionately affected the African-American community. Isolation has not been a solution. And in the US where people are a bit too much of freedom loving, uh, quarantine is something that people find hard to do. Inherently, people want to wander around, socialize, et cetera. And we are going through this phase of what we call COVID fatigue. Having tried to quarantine in the last few months, people are now breaking quarantine, just essentially unable to isolate or quarantine. We continue to try to educate people to stay apart as much as we can. It works some part of the time, other parts of the time, people seem to have selective deafness to it. And clearly the role of masks has been proven not so much because it's a filter, but it essentially, we protect each other by wearing a mask. When we wear a mask, we spread the amount of aerosol or cloud is much less. And so we protect the other person who is close to us and vice versa. So that's why masks are still pushed and encouraged strongly. In the US where uh, dining and social and communal gathering, especially as we get into November is Thanksgiving. So it's large family gathering time, and that's something we're strongly discouraging right now. So that is something that we're pushing. We're not sure how successful we will be, but definitely something uh, to consider. And uh, we have a big challenge with schools and colleges and their reopening. Most of it has now gone virtual from initially opening in person because teachers are protesting, saying that they do not want to be in a classroom where they could be infected by children who might be asymptomatic carriers. And uh, so therefore there's this huge challenge of meeting in person. We do know the impact of social gatherings. So this is a study from Hong Kong where they looked at a wedding and they looked at temples and bars and essentially showed wherever there is a gathering of people these are just every person represents a potential contact who became infected and just goes to show how the spread of any aerosol borne illness occurs, which is a sobering thought because this continues to be a challenge. Uh, in the US, we've had issues with isolation. When patients are admitted in hospital, they don't uh, allow visitors. So we were using FaceTime, we're using iPads, et cetera, to communicate with family members so that they can at least have some contact with each other. Uh, nursing homes are particularly isolated. So you have the elderly who had to be isolated in nursing homes. They couldn't allow any visitors because they are particularly vulnerable. And, and most of the deaths in the US occurred in the nursing home population, which is the elderly. And so the current challenge is the vaccine. There are several studies and trials available for vaccines which are going on right now, we are hopeful that these vaccines will provide better immunity, at least preliminary studies seem to suggest the immunity induced by the vaccine seems to be stronger than the immunity afforded by the actual disease. And so the question now is, how long will that immunity last? How often do we need to take a vaccine? And how safe is the vaccine? All questions that are being looked at right now Hopefully we will have an answer before the end of the year and hopefully vaccines will be available for distribution all through 2021. So back to the topic, this was just a, a background to, to focus us back on the topic in question. So John 13 verse 30, and it was night, a Paul Ratri Ayrnu. The context is the last supper in the upper room. So the first thing that we might say is it was night as an expression of time. It was night because it was more than just the time of day for chronological accuracy. If we review the preceding verses in the chapter, it says the evening meal was in progress. Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. 
he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I am your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There was darkness outside signifying the time of the day after the sun had set. It is also a somber time in that while the disciples may not have realized the full extent of events that were about to happen, Jesus knew what was going to happen Next, and so his somber mood, the act of washing the disciples' feet, etc., created that somber environment reflected by the lack of sunshine that metaphorically brings joy to the heart and a ray of brightness. It was night. There was a sense of emptiness. God never empties places in our homes and hearts or in the nation or the church without being ready to fill them. He sometimes empties them so that he may fill them. Sorrow and loss may come to prepare us for the vision of God and their effect should be to purge the inward eye so that it may see him. When leaves fall from the trees in the forest, we can see the blue sky, which was hidden by their dense abundance. If the passing of all that can pass drives us to him who cannot pass, if the unchanging God stands out more clear, more near, more dear because of change, then that emptiness was probably meant for the good. It was night outside of Judas, a key figure in the story that evolves. He had walked out to master the troops, to master the troops with whom he had made elaborate plans to track Jesus as he walked through the valley of Kidron. It was night in the world that had failed to recognize God in the form of Jesus. A world outside of Judas that had failed to acknowledge the father or the son. It was night for many like Judas who found it the best time to collude with other like-minded people to perpetuate the darkness that they were in. It was night outside of Judas. It was night within Judas. He had sold the loyalty of the last three years for a mere 30 pieces of silver. All Jesus' teachings and his miracles, the faith of all the people who flocked to him, had not made an impact on him. Having been around Jesus had not rubbed off on him at all, unlike Peter, who was accused by the chief priest servant girl, Surely you were with him because your accent gives you away. He was focused on his elaborate plans to use his insider connections to attempt to catch Jesus unawares, given that he had eluded their prior attempts to arrest him in the past. 
It was a chance to be a hero in front of the Jews and the high priests. It was night within Judas. The World Health Organization in its Almata Russia declaration said, health is not merely the absence of disease, but the complete emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being of a person. Thus, in addition to the physical and emotional or mental health of a person, complete health was only achieved with the attaining of spiritual health. The question is, why be spiritually healthy? Spirituality or religion are not synonymous. For purposes of our conversation, I will use the term spirituality and faith interchangeably, even though they are not exactly the same. Spirituality or faith involves a personal relationship with God and the application of that relationship to various life situations. While religion really relates to faith and practices as communicated by one's ancestors and further tempered by social beliefs. So a few questions to ponder. Is suffering because of wrongdoing? Is sickness a punishment from God? Does God exist at the bedside? So I have to digress into a story in Malayalam here. നമ്മുടെ ക്രിസ്താസ്റ്റൻ തിരുമേനിയെ കുറിച്ച് പല ഫലിതകൾ കേട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് സോ തിരുമേനി തന്നെ പറഞ്ഞ ഒരു കഥയാണിത് തിരുമേനി ബിഷപ്പായിട്ട് ഇരിക്കുമ്പോൾ തിരുവനന്തപുരത്ത് ഒരു വീട്ടിൽ പോയി അപ്പം സാധാരണ ഇങ്ങനെ പാരിഷ് വിസിറ്റ്സ് നടത്തുമ്പോൾ ഇങ്ങനെ ഓരോ വീടുകളിൽ ചെല്ലും അപ്പം പാരിഷിൽ ചെല്ലുമ്പോൾ അച്ഛനെ ഇങ്ങനെ അസുഖമുള്ള ആരെങ്കിലും ഒക്കെ ഉണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അവരുടെ വീടുകളൊക്കെ കൊണ്ടുപോയി ഒന്ന് വിസിറ്റ് ചെയ്യിപ്പിക്കും അപ്പം തിരുമേനി ഇതുപോലെ ഒരു വീട്ടിൽ ചെന്നു അപ്പം ആ ഒരു സ്ത്രീ ഒത്തിരി വർഷങ്ങളായിട്ട് ഇങ്ങനെ അസുഖമായിട്ടൊക്കെ കിടപ്പായിരുന്നു അപ്പം പുള്ളിക്കാരി ഇങ്ങനെ അസുഖത്തിനെ കുറിച്ചൊക്കെ പറഞ്ഞു അപ്പൊ തിരുമേനി എന്തോ ആ പറയേണ്ടിയെന്ന് അറിയത്തില്ല അപ്പം തിരുമേനി തന്നെ പറഞ്ഞു ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞു സാറാമേ ദൈവം നിന്നെ സ്നേഹിക്കുന്ന കൊണ്ടാണ് ഈ അസുഖമൊക്കെ ഉണ്ടായത് അപ്പൊ ഉടനെ ആ സ്ത്രീ തിരുമേനിയോട് പറഞ്ഞു തിരുമേനി എന്ന ഒരു കാര്യം ചെയ്യണം ദൈവത്തിനോട് പറ കുറച്ചു നാള് എന്നെ ഒന്ന് സ്നേഹിക്കുന്ന നിർത്തിയിട്ട് അപ്പുറത്തെ മറിയാമേ ഒന്ന് സ്നേഹിക്കാൻ പറ Does spirituality connote a physician's inability to give a scientific explanation for phenomena? For those of us in the medical world, this is the conundrum we face. Does the use of modern medical interventions preclude the need for religion? Do I risk invoking a patient's ire by God talk? Is spirituality the result of a social neurosis? is spirituality rekindled because of a lack of satisfaction with current professional and domestic life are we in an era of technological prowess that has engendered problems that can't be solved by technology leading to a moral vacuum the verses in this poem sum it up well deferential glad to be of use politic cautious and meticulous full of high sentence but a bit of tues at times indeed almost ridiculous almost at times the fool we try to marry this religion our faith science and we often don't have a clear explanation so we sort of fumble around it because sometimes our faith is not strong enough to explain what science cannot explain There is a feeling that science and faith are at loggerheads and are contradictory to each other. So this is Dr. Francis Collins. He is the director of the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, the preeminent medical institution in the world based in Bethesda, Maryland. Growing up, Collins' religious instruction was limited to being sent to the local Episcopal church choir to learn music. As he says, I was instructed by my dad to ignore the rest of it which I did. In college and then graduate school he found himself moving from the category of agnostic to atheist. Collins later met a Methodist pastor Sam McMillan who introduced Collins to the work of C.S. Lewis starting with mere Christianity. It was not the answer he was looking for. but it was for collins the answer he eventually found at 27 he became a christian 
The embrace of that faith transformed not only his relationship with God, but also how he viewed other people and himself. He said, I quote, I think I've also arrived at a place where my faith has become a really strong support for dealing with life struggles. It took me a while. I think that sense that God is sufficient, and that I don't have to be strong in every circumstance. Collins was the founder and the creative force behind BioLogos, an organization that invites the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith. He says, and I quote again, scientists by their nature are trying to understand how nature works. And I think the message to scientists has to be there are really important questions that fall outside of what science is able to address meaningfully, such as why is there something instead of nothing? What is the meaning of love? Is there a God? What happens after you die? Those are not questions for which science or scientific methods can be applied." End quote. He believes scientists would be better served by getting outside of a mindset that says the only questions worth asking are those about the material world. Faith is not a treatment and so cannot be scientifically measured. Spirituality of faith is not a substitute for technology or modern therapeutics, but an adjunct to current treatment modalities. Our faith helps people cope better with life's ups and downs, their ability to integrate life changes and relieve the stress that goes with it. We can practice our faith without encroaching on each other's religiosity. We are often unable to live with uncertainty, but we are also unable to live with helplessness or failure. Faith requires humility, the ability to recognize and express one's limitation. Faith calls for compassion, especially when technology and therapeutics fail. Our faith reminds us that we are wounded healers that we are frail and exposed to the same illness that may affect another. Our faith instills in us equanimity. So William Osler, the father of medicine is said, cultivate then gentlemen, such a judicious measure of obtuseness as will enable you to meet the exigencies of practice with firmness and courage without at the same time hardening the human heart by which we live. Wilderness moments, while they can look and feel like death, can also be where God meets us. In this particular disorienting season, we may feel abandoned, alone, and forgotten by God. The pandemic feels too big. Even as we go through our own losses, anxiety, or pain, we lament the situations of people experiencing poverty or displacement, people who don't seem ever to arrive in a promised land of their own. What are we Christians to do with so much suffering, injustice, sin, and death? The wilderness place in the biblical story is never simply a place of abandonment. When Hagar ran from the abuse of her mistress Sarai, it's in the wilderness that she met the Lord whom she called the God who sees me. Genesis chapter 16, verse 13. When the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt, it was the wilderness wanderings that tested them and reoriented them towards God. There they were provided for, even as their resources were limited, in seasons such as the one we are now in, we find ourselves stripped of many comforts, any false sense of control, and other delusions we have about being autonomous from God. 
It's here that we are offered the chance to get to know a God who uses his power on behalf of his people. A God who hems us in with cloud and fire. Wilderness moments, while they can look and feel like death, can also be where God meets us. Can I grow without pain? Do I believe God uses loss to make me more like his son? Is it possible this pandemic might reorient my trust in the power of a good and loving God? Our temptation is always to bypass suffering, to get the good life without the pain. In her book, A Beautiful Disaster, author Marlena Graves writes, he brought us out to save us, to show us his power, to offer his comfort, and to put to death whatever is in us that is not of him. Being finite, we do not understand how the providence and the goodness of God interact with the evil of this virus. But we know that in God's economy, nothing is wasted. As with all of the trials we walk through, he makes use of these experiences to sanctify and lead us closer to him. The desert will either draw us deeper into the story of a good God or cause us to turn our backs in favor of our own kingdoms of control. So what can the church do? From the church's experience of responding to other emergency and epidemic situations, we know that there are at least three key roles the church can play in such times to promote preparedness and resilience. Number one, to give hope and combat fear with accurate information and encouragement through our faith. Number two, to keep the worshiping and wider community connected, if necessary, via messages, phone, online, in cases of quarantine or disruption. And number three, to show God's compassion and care to those affected in our communities, remembering that those already most vulnerable will be the most affected. Max Lucado, the well-known pastor and writer said, I thought about the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus himself was afraid. It struck me that Jesus faced his own fear by going to pray and by taking people to pray with him. That's the picture of a healthy church. The church is the modern day version of the Garden of Gethsemane. A healthy church is a place where I can go and cry out in fear. It's a place where I can find a community of people, my own Peter, James, and John, in whom I can be honest and say, please pray with me about this fear. The church becomes the place where fear goes to die. The church becomes the place where fear goes to die. He further says, the phrase I like to use is, Fear will always knock at your door, but just don't invite it in to stay. Let fear do its work. Let it alert me to potential dangers. Let it alert me to make sure that I'm managing my money or as well as I could, or that my children are protected or whatever. But then step into the state of faith instead of fear. Even in this global pandemic, as we approach the Christmas season, Jesus, whom we call Emmanuel, God with us, lives up to his name and is with us. So I ask, is it or will it still be night within and around us? Or is it or will it be light in and around us? Before we begin a discussion or reflect on what we have just heard, let me close with a prayer by Cameron Wiggins-Belm entitled, Prayer for a Pandemic. 
May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May those who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their own health or making their rent. May those who have the flexibility to care for our children when schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel a trip remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May those who settle for quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God for our neighbor. Amen. Thank you, Georgie, taking us through this uh, wonderful experience of responding to the challenges that COVID has uh, put on us. So now this is the time for a question and answer session. So those who wish to answer, uh, wish to ask questions, you can raise your thumb and uh, you can unmute yourself and ask question, please. Okay, I think you please respond. May I not be asking questions. You can comment or add what Georgi has already said. Yeah, uh, Dr. Georgi, uh, thank you for this enlightening uh, message. Uh, I would like to check um, as a faith community in the, in the, the various churches, in the US, uh, how they uh, responded to this pandemic uh, in, a, in, in a social, in the social sphere or whatever field they, sphere, sphere they can help the community at large. Has any effort been done? And could you please enlighten us on that? Sure, thank you. Uh, yes, churches have uh, taken a lot of leadership in terms of especially communities uh, which have uh, disproportionately communities of color, as we call it. So the poorer communities were where the church really has fulfilled its role, not only in terms of the faith aspect of it, but also in terms of being able to support their communities economically with material goods, etc. during this pandemic. So illness affects people. A uh, lot of people lost jobs during this time. And so difficulty meeting their basic rent, uh, putting food on the table, taking care of their children. And uh, clearly there have been deaths which are disproportionately higher in that sort of a community. So this is really where our faith is in action. And so as a church community, we say, it's not only instilling the faith as we talked about the church being the place where people can put fear aside and come and experience the faith of God but also where we can do faith in action, as we call it, where we really help them meet some of their essential needs so that they can continue to survive. Otherwise, they would be shaken in their own confidence about thinking what is faith if it is just going to be words and not going to translate. How is it going to translate in my life? How does it translate with my family? So I think as a, as a church community, we are constantly called uh, to do that. Um, so uh, an example, our own uh, uh, Matuma church here 
So during the pandemic here, during the height of the pandemic, one of the biggest challenges most hospitals faced in the US was the lack of personal protective equipment, be it gowns, masks, uh, et cetera. And so our uh, church community got together and actually uh, contacted companies and paid for uh, donations of masks and gloves and gowns and other equipment to hospitals. Uh, they sponsored food for some of the healthcare workers who were working long hours and not able to go home and uh, get uh, extra food because restaurants had closed down, etc. And uh, a tremendous witness. It was uh, amazing to see people get together and join. So one of the things we discovered earlier, as I alluded to, was the role of masks. And so for the average person who walks in and out of a hospital or when we are out in the community, we really don't need the standard surgical mask that we wear or the N95. The N95 mask is only useful for when you're taking care of an actual patient with it. So cloth masks were, dis were developed. And so somebody did uh, a little tailoring instruction, put a little piece together, which said, how would you make masks? And so the women of our church came together and people bought material, people who had sewing machines started sewing, and we produced about 300 or 400 masks, which we used to distribute. So what hospitals did was as patients or family members came in, we would give them masks, and when they leave the hospital, we take them back, we launder them, and then we reuse them. So it's uh, these sort of things where not only we were, so in my own hospital where they helped a lot because uh, of our relationship here, with our church, uh, our uh, hospital administration asked me, who is this church that has come forward to do things like this? And so it was a matter of pride for me to say our church is more than just uh, our faith in terms of worship, but our church is faith in action. And it was really a witness to the rest of the community as to how a church can be more relevant and us as a faith community both more relevant, not only in terms of words, but also in terms of deeds. So I think that's a great question. Churches have stepped forward in general, but in our church has done wonderfully. And I think our Mathama churches across the US have done similarly, uh, a lot of wonderful work uh, as well, uh, helping out local communities, uh, caregivers, et cetera, which is uh, so, so uh, critical and valuable at this time. Uh, Georgie, I have a question. Please, Georgie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First, uh, let me say how wonderful it is to see you <laughs> after a very long time. Um, I hope the family is doing well. Uh, secondly, it was a very, very uh, informative and apt message. Uh, continuing the, the message, uh, the question on the question that the other Georgie just asked. And your response indicates that churches across America have been a witness uh, as a place of succor, as a place of refuge, as a place of, as a beacon. Uh, but in the same breath, in the same token, churches across the US have stood against, uh, they have helped promote politicizing the mask, uh, standing against science, belittling those who uh, have offered help and advice and good, good, good advice uh, um, uh, to, to, um, to counter this whole pandemic. So they've done a lot of things in negative. So the question here is this, with both of these at play, both forces, the same church, the same people of God acting in two different directions, opposing what do you think, uh, what would you say is the net effect? How has this, one has been definitely a good witness, a very positive one. How do people view the other? Excellent question. And uh, that is an unfortunate reality. You point out an absolutely valid reality. Uh, this is what I was alluding to earlier when I was trying to say that science and uh, our faith are not antagonistic, but actually complementary, as somebody just commented in the chat section, and that is right uh, spot on. Unfortunately, that is not what, uh, especially most of the evangelical type of churches, uh, so much so that they, you know, people said, oh, this, if uh, we don't need masks, we don't need science, 
if it is God's will, I will be protected no matter what, and I will never get the virus, which is sort of to say that God never believes the whole prosperity gospel type of a thing that if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, only goodness will come to you. You will always be affluent. You will always be wealthy. There will never be pain. There will never be suffering, which is very contradictory to what the Bible teaches clearly. And so that has been a huge paradox. And so what, uh, what you said, the net effect has been that this has been more emphasized or appeared in media, social media, et cetera, all emphasizing that. And so the good works that churches have done have sort of been overshadowed by the whole concept that this is a scientific hoax, this is the work of the devil, this is not uh, science, this is contradictory to our faith. If we believe in scientific principles, then that means we are going against God, which is not true. Nowhere does God say that we should stop, uh, you know, the same people who would otherwise go to hospital for their own care, all of a sudden, is as if that medical care is contradictory to God's will in some way or the other. So that is a challenge, which unfortunately has been a distortion of our faith, I believe. There are no biblical uh, principles which support that sort of a position. And, but there is a subsection of people who sort of believe it blindly, and so have taken that to the extreme and have become a challenge, which is the reason we believe why the, we have not been able to, as the most affluent country in the world, still not been able to control an, a pandemic. And we are doing worse than most of the developing countries in the world is uh, reflective of the fact that there is this huge contradiction which goes on to science and common sense and good health to say that as if that was not necessary from a faith standpoint, that if you're a believing Christian, that you're sort of ironclad and nothing can ever come to you, which is not true. I mean, the Bible tells us all along that suffering and pain are part of our growing experience and that even the best of Christians can always have illness come to them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are contravening uh, God or our faith. So thank you for pointing that out. That's an absolutely valid observation. I think there's a question on the chat which said, what is our view of when vaccine will be available? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So we've been involved with most of the vaccine trials, et cetera. So the challenges to vaccine development have been the following. There are three different types of technology being used to develop vaccines. One of the three technologies is very novel, the use of what's called messenger RNA, which is you instilling a tiny fragment of the uh, virus into the person's uh, body, and you're training that body to form antibiotics so that when they are then challenged with uh, antibody, sorry, so that when they're challenged with disease, they'll be able to fight. I showed you the spike on the protein, so the body develops the antibody. So that has never in the history of vaccine development ever been used to develop a vaccine in the past. So it's a novel technology. So no one knows if it will work. So that's why they're doing large scale studies right now, 30,000 to 40,000 people. The other challenge with the enrolling in vaccines has been, we want to have diversity in the patient population that is the candidate for the vaccine. So. It's easy to get the young, healthy volunteers to get the vaccine, but that's not the people who are affected disproportionately. The people affected are the older, the sicker, the gen uh, ethnically different groups. So African, African-American, Hispanics in, in the uh, American hemisphere, Asians, etc. So to have that diversity of pool of people so that we want to know that the vaccine works well in all these groups, not selectively in the young and the healthy who are maybe less vulnerable to complications compared to others. So that has been the challenge in keeping, in getting all the people enrolled. Uh, if you know the history of uh, medicine in the US, there are the African-American community were used as guinea pigs in a famous uh, trial uh, involving many of them being inflicted with syphilis so as to develop treatments for it. So because of that, there is this history of uh, distrust or mistrust of the scientific community by the African-American community. They feel they're being used as guinea pigs. And so because of that, it's been difficult to enroll many of them in trials. So the earliest vaccine reaching completion is John, uh, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer 
And so they are close to completion, which means somewhere around the end of November, they will submit to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, for an emergency approval, which means sometime in December. So while these vaccines are still in development, because the preliminary studies already show it's working well, they have started mass manufacturing the vaccines in trust, literally, which is also unprecedented. So for example, there is a company in India, in India called the Serum Institutes of India. Their only role is to mass produce vaccines. So the Oxford vaccine that's manufactured by AstraZeneca is now being manufactured. A hundred million doses are being manufactured by the Serum Institute of India with the goal that 50 million will be used within India and 50 million used in other parts of the world. So that is this accelerated timeline. So to put in perspective, the normal timeline for vaccine development is three to five years at the minimum. This is uh, six to 12 months, we will have a vaccine uh, developed, which is unprecedented. So because of the pace at which things go forward, there is concern and politicians obviously using that to their advantage in terms of trying to say that they are the ones instrumental in developing a cure. Uh, therefore, there is skepticism among people that this is being rushed, that safety will not be taken care of completely, and that there might be some unintended consequences of healthy people getting a vaccine that it might cause illness. So the scientific community is struggling now to develop a messaging to convince people that there is enough thought and care which goes into development of these vaccines, that there is enough caution and precautions being used and that the final vaccine would be something which is safe to use for the general population. So we expect in 2021, there will be ongoing development and more widespread use. The questions that are unanswered still are how long the effect of the vaccine lasts. Is it three months, six months, one year? Uh, do, are they one dose or two dose vaccines? We know that one of them is only a one dose vaccine. Many of them are two dose vaccines. And how often will they need to be given? And will there be a second generation which are still better than the first generation of vaccines developed? All these are questions still unanswered as of this point in time. But the scientific community's biggest task now is not so much the science, but developing messaging to instill confidence in the general public that the product being developed is safe and effective and uh, can be used without concerns of developing an unexplained illness or an unknown complication. Hi, Dr. Jones. Uh, Sujish Alexander, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned messaging. So I was also just curious that uh, I think uh, also this, this disease, uh, COVID-19, also involves a sort of stigma for the people who the people who got it, right? So is the messaging also should, should, should encompass that, you know, it's not that something that we have to avoid people giving, the, giving hope they, who have this disease or who has caught this disease in the past. Because as I see it, uh, the stigma of having it and uh, the isolation, at least in India, uh, the messages I'm hearing from a lot from India is a lot, it's a lot bad if you're somebody getting in the committee or you're being becoming the new untouchables of sorts. So very good point. Too? Yeah, yeah, that's an absolutely valid point, and I agree. I've heard the same as well. So much so that there, is, the belief is that there is underrepresentation in terms of number of case counts in India. That it's far higher than what it is because people do not want to declare that they have illness because they become sort of like almost an untouchable, as was just said, absolutely true. So social stigma, uh, we, so, you know, when HIV first came out, this was the same sort of problem we encountered that uh, the stigma around it. And I remember seeing a nice quote from New Zealand, which said that uh, HIV and uh, uh, HIV is due to a disease but fear is due to ignorance, but both kill. In other words, saying that uh, the stigma is what can sometimes be worse than the actual illness. So illness is not always acquired because somebody was careless. A number of people get ill because it's in the air. So we have this problem of asymptomatic transmission. So unlike most viral illnesses where we transmit infection when we develop symptoms. So when we, are, when we have a cold, we are coughing and sneezing, 
that's when we are, we are transmitting symptoms. In COVID, at least for three days, we know at least 72 hours prior to their developing the actual manifesting with signs of the infection, they are already transmitting infection. So that's what's called the asymptomatic, or we sometimes call it the pre-symptomatic uh, transmission phase. So that is a population that is very, very difficult to identify and diagnose. And so there is a subsection of people who will acquire infection just because you never know who you've been with. This is why we push, push the public health measures of masking and distancing because we do not know who the person who looks well and is in front of us may actually be the one who may be harboring virus. And this is particularly so in the younger people who tend to have much lower symptoms, but can be equally effective in transmitting disease. So excellent point that uh, we need to take away the the fear, the stigma around it, that's not what's constructive. What's constructive is taking care of the person who's unwell, using our common sense in terms of public health measures. And then for us, definitely using our faith to, to be uh, work in tandem with our public health measures, not in lieu of public health measures, but actually in tandem with it so that we continue to know that after having exercised all good judgment, that we go in faith knowing that God, our life is in God's hands, our health is in God's hands, et cetera. That would be what uh, our, our approach would be or should be so that uh, we uh, do not cause this degree of uh, fear and stigma that is uh, well pointed out. Absolutely correct. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I think there's a comment in the chat section saying the second and third waves, despite measures because of the population density in countries because of crowding and deaths, or is not the case because of isolation. So it's interesting, the second and third waves, correct, uh, could be a combination of uh, crowding population. It's also because uh, in India, for example, the, the India is a study in and of itself. So initially, when the... Um, pandemic started, India went into the serious lockdown phase and they locked down for months on end, but the lockdown was not effective because they really couldn't control in addition to the lockdown. They only did a lockdown. They weren't able to control in other terms of public health measures, et cetera. And so after a period of time, because of the severe economic depression, they were forced to open up because people started uh, rioting to the point of because when poverty hits and they do not have money to put food on the table, they had to open up. And when they opened up with the crowding and overcrowding, it spread like wildfire. So now you have almost uh, the equal problem of the beginning with the additional burden of a severe economic depression because of a lockdown, which was ineffective and now people are desperate. And so it's uh, essentially uh, just spreading like wildfire. And uh, what uh, there was a nice commentary in the New York Times where they interviewed people. And so, which is why you're seeing a big movement of the Hindutva movement in India, because religion is what uh, is being used to tie people together and saying that, you know, if you're a Hindu, you need to support the government, which is extremely pro-Hindu. And so therefore, you know, you need to be united at this time. This is not the time to rebel against the government's measures. And so people have actually been interviewed on the streets and have quoted saying, oh, how can we go against our own religions, government, and so on, so on. So they're using that as a way to unite people or, dissent, or to quell dissent because people are seriously affected. So it's been a study in how not to handle a pandemic, but again, you know, as they say, hindsight is 2020. So after the fact, we all appear smarter, but at that time, but that's been the challenge in India. So it's absolutely well, point is well taken that in developing countries, but a developed country like the US has no excuse as well. And our problem has been our government has not been uh, equally emphatic. There has been a lot of mixed messaging. Uh, you know, our president has sort of gone out and said that it, this is just like the flu. This is almost over. Everything is going to be fine. We should basically open up the country. Uh, all this uh, thing about masks, etc., is bogus. We shouldn't be doing any of this. And on the other side, you have the scientific community and physicians and experts in public health saying, please don't do that because that's going to cause spread. 
And needless to state, you see the dichotomy where uh, local state governments in some states who endorse the former point of view are the ones where virus is spreading like wildfire right now. Uh, states where uh, the latter point of view is endorsed much better, where public health makes more sense, have been able to control the infection better. Uh, so it's this uh, constant dichotomy of, and as was alluded to earlier, this is why I keep coming back to the point that science and public health and our faith are not contradictory. We have to use them in tandem, otherwise uh, it defeats the purpose of what we are doing. Dr. George, hi, this is uh, Libu, Libu Kurula, and I have, uh, I have actually uh, three short questions. One is, I just wanted to understand from you, what is, is, there a, is there a science behind the herd immunity that we keep hearing about? And if that is, um, and do you think in places like India and Indonesia, that is now becoming the unspoken strategy to address uh, the pandemic? The second point, um, possibly related to it, how do we explain in your scientific community that now in China, uh, we understand that it is all back to normal, you know, office workers are going back to offices, sitting next to each other without any mask in a country with a billion point three plus people. And lastly, as a man of God, what do you expect, or how, how do you figure out what do you think God is trying to tell us, tell the world through, through this pandemic and, you know, when it happens once in, like you said, once in 100 years, and you don't get the benefit of uh, uh, enjoying to reflect on it many times in your lifetime. Um, so what, what, do you, what do you think God is trying to say through this pandemic? Is it going to be like the Tower of Babel where he's trying to knock on the technology and advances of mankind and sending them back to their homes uh, to kind of uh, reflect? So those were the three quick questions that I had in mind to ask you. Great question. So, so the concept of herd immunity. So the concept of herd immunity comes from the 1920s in the farming world in the United States. So the concept was that if you allowed enough animals to get sick, the animals would recover from the illness and then would be immune so that you would protect other animals which had not become sick. So while the concept was good in concept, what happened in reality was that the animals that became sick ended up having to be sacrificed because they were too sick and never recovered. And so you had widespread deaths. And so as a result, the quote herd immunity never happened. And so when vaccines started being developed, the same concept of herd immunity was proposed, which is that if you have a sufficient number of people who have been given a vaccine, uh, in a community, then they form an immune barrier so that then the people who are not infected as yet, even if they have not received vaccine, disease will not spread because people who are immune will not in turn transmit disease. So in the setting of COVID-19, the problem with herd immunity is uh, that's what the UK is proposing, what is called the challenge trial. So which means they want young and healthy people to actually get sick with the infection and hope that they recover and that if there are sufficient number of people who've recovered and are immune for a period of time, you form this barrier to prevent further spread of infection. Now, the, the assumptions in that is that everybody who becomes sick is going to recover completely without complications and are going to feel completely well. There is going to be no deaths as a result of which you will have this cohort of people who are healthy enough to prevent spread of infection. The reality is that is not true. Neither do uh, young people are not immune. In other words, not that they don't get illness. One, they do get illness. We have deaths among young people. In fact, the surge of infection in the US right now is not among the elderly, it's among the younger people because they are the people who distance less, et cetera. So the co concept of herd immunity does not apply to a disease where there is mortality and complications which can cause an un provoked or unexpected response, which we cannot control. It's an uncontrolled outcome that you're looking for. And so that's why the concept of herd immunity just does not apply, which is why the WHO has come out with it. Everyone else is, uh, in the scientific community says, please do not think that you know herd immunity, because somebody else got sick and is well, they're going to protect us from getting sick. That's a myth. So that should be disposed of. So the concept of herd immunity doesn't fly right now in the setting of illness. 
Uh, number two, question about people returning to work. So in the US, most work companies have, uh, who can afford to have people work from home have basically closed their office. They've asked their people to clear out their desks and go and sit from home. And this will be most, more or less permanent that they're going to be working from home. So we have large uh, office buildings which are completely empty and no one is working in them and nobody's protected to, predicted to come back to work in those. So very different concept. I couldn't comment about what happens in Singapore or other parts of the world, but uh, definitely in the US, there's a big migration away from office based spaces in homes. So the what's the challenge of that twofold? Number one, the companies have transferred their expenses to you as the employee, because when you work from home, you pay for your internet, you pay for your electricity, you pay for your water, you pay for everything else. Number two, what happens? There are no work hours, right? In the office, you were there from eight to five. At five o'clock, you close shop, you go home. Now there is no shop to close because you're at home all the time. So people are unable to get away from their computer, unable to get away from work enough. So we are seeing uh, people's weights go up. So obesity is becoming an increasing problem. Uh, people don't exercise as much because they don't get away from their desks. It's only five steps to walk up to the bathroom and back, and that's basically it. While otherwise they would have had to walk down a hallway, maybe uh, 10 feet or 100 feet to go to a bathroom. And so there are those challenges. People tend to snack much more because you have food sitting around at home. So in between, you, you munch on something, you munch on something more, and you're not burning off those calories, so they pack on the pounds. So that's the challenge of that. And the last question is, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is our Christian response? Is this punishment from God and so on? It's interesting. C.S. Lewis, uh, the famous Christian writer, said uh, suffering is God's megaphone to a deaf world. So uh, meaning in the, in the implication that, uh, you know, all suffering was necessarily bad and punishment. And I'm not sure that uh, uh, that's necessarily a true a Christian perspective, I will defer to Achin for his thoughts as well, but suffering and pain are part of our Christian life, and I believe it causes us to grow more, it causes us to bring us more closer to God, not necessarily seen as punitive, but more seen as a growth. If we grow in our faith when we have, if it is all roses or all comfort, then I don't think we our faith would be as robust as if we had uh, gone through suffering and experiences. So I'll, I'll ask Achin to comment. Uh, Achin is probably much better expert in this than I am. Achin. Yeah. Um, I think that no, some people have the opinion that uh, God may be taking time to recycle all things, you know, because the pollution are there. Now he want to rescue the world from uh, um, this ultimate uh, destruction. So this is a time of lockdown. In that period, you now God can uh, rebuild, restructure the whole world. Yeah. But I'm 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 still uh, not a person to tell that. No, uh, it may not be a barber towel thing. No, God won't destroy the whole culture. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe some lessons are there. I'm also trying to understand what are the lessons. God is trying to uh, teaching the humanity, but still I'm I'm uh, on research. You know I don't know. <laughs> so maybe somebody in the group can enlighten us. Absolutely open to anybody else's perspective as well. I agree with Achin as well. I I don't know that I have a final explanation for it as well. Still trying to figure out. I mean it it comes down to the fundamental question we always ask: Why does suffering occur? And why is there pain and why is there death? And uh, is that all because, uh, is there a negative connotation only to it or is there something positive we can see in it? So curious to get others' viewpoints as well. If uh, no questions are there, uh, can we wind up the session any questions or we will wind up soon <laughs>